Joseph, who has been a blessing to Pharaoh along with his family, has died. And about 400 years into the story before we get to Moses, the Egyptians have oppressed the Israelites and they've become slaves because over the generations, Scripture tells us the rulers of Egypt forgot about Joseph. And when that forgetful leader came to the throne, looked around and saw all these Israelites in the midst and said, these people could bring some serious trouble to us. <laughs> and so we better do something. And what do they do, of course, rather than form alliances and make friends, they oppress them and put them into forced labor. They make them slaves. So for 400 years, the Israelites are in bondage to the Egyptians in growing levels of extremity. So we're going to talk today not about Moses and that story of Exodus, but about that in-between time, between Joseph and Moses, and about bondage. So as a student of history, one of the things that, that I am ever aware of is our history in our country of bondage as well. We celebrate, or we acknowledge rather, the anniversary of the first slave ships to our shores in about 1619. Um, the Dutch first brought slaves from Africa to these shores. So it's been almost 400 years in this country that we have held people in bondage. And the reason I say held people in bondage is not because it ended with the Civil War, though we did fight a massive civil war um, over the issue of slavery and bondage, but because we still are oppressing some of the same people as well as others. Certainly we oppressed Native Americans as soon as Columbus landed. Um, so that's sort of a separate parallel line of bondage. But we held people in bondage, in very literal bondage for a long time. But we still do that same thing today when we have we have a cat in the today, by the way. <laughs> with us. So we held we held people in chains literally, but we continue to hold people in chains figuratively when we have racial injustice or we have economic injustice. We have all kinds of ways of holding people in bondage. Mm -hmm. And those are things that we as a people must cry out, just like the Israelites cried out, and say, enough, no more. Somehow God, deliver us from this injustice. And God sent a deliverer, we know that, and we'll hear more about that next week, but we cry out too. And sometimes we forget that when we cry out for God to deliver us from the injustice that goes on in our worlds, we forget to look in the mirror and say, maybe God's calling me to release someone from bondage in some way, whether it's the way that I vote or the activism that I engage in or the economic practices that I partake in or the educational things that I do, all kinds of ways that we as a people can fight against injustice in ending bondage for other people. And as important as that work is, and as passionate as I can be about that, and I am frequently on a soapbox about those issues, <laughs> um, here or elsewhere, I think sometimes the most severe form of bondage that we have is the bondage we place ourselves. And so today we're going to focus on that kind of bondage. There are all kinds of ways that we put ourselves in chains and keep ourselves from living the free life that God has designed for us. Sometimes we are in bondage to things. We are so concerned about money and wealth and those kinds of things in our society and as individuals that we get distracted from the things that really matter. Because the things that matter aren't things. The things that matter are our families and our friends and our loved ones and the people around us. But we can become so easily chained to the insecurity that comes with finances, sometimes to greed that comes with finances. Sometimes the greatest bondage is not in being poor, but in having wealth. Because it's far harder to let go sometimes when we have placed that value on wealth than it is for the poor who have nothing to let go. If we look at statistics, we know that it is the poor who actually give more charitably than the rich. Even percentage-wise, we know that this is the case. 
because it's sometimes harder to give up wealth than to give up something that's just money. All right, so there are lots of ways that we put ourselves in bondage in terms of finances. But there are ways that we put ourselves in bondage otherwise too, sometimes emotionally. Some of us hang on to anger or grudges. Someone has offended us and it's far easier to hold on to that anger than to talk with that person and to work it out and to let it go. Because you know what? Anger is a really powerful feeling. Mm -hmm. We feel powerful and strong when we are angry because it's a powerful emotion. And here's the thing about anger. If you're in bondage to it and it has its hold on you, it can be really destructive to you. It can be destructive to you physically. We know that our bodies respond to stress and anger physically in destructive ways. But anger doesn't have to hold you in bondage just because you have it. There is righteous anger that can move us and motivate us to do the right thing, to change injustice, to fight against oppression. So anger, whether it is a tool or a chain, depends on how it's used. If anger is something holding you in bondage, I encourage you to unlock those chains and to let them go. Sometimes our bondage is about those things that we are addicted to. And that may be drugs, or that may be alcohol, or that may be food, or that may be love, that romantic sort of thing. Many people are addicted to that particular stage of relationship. They're great for six months, and then they're gone. Because that romantic feeling sometimes can fade. And they'll look for the next fix. Because it is a chemical fix, just like a drug. There are all kinds of addictions that we have in our society. And those can hold us in bondage. We are sometimes in bondage to distraction. And I think this is one of those subtle ones in our society that we sometimes will think about. Some of us get so busy being busy because it keeps us from thinking about things that are maybe more challenging, or it keeps us from feeling, or it keeps us from something else, that we get in bondage to busyness. Our society is built on the idea that being busy is somehow good, that we must always be doing something, doing, doing work especially, being productive in some way, that many of us have forgotten what it is to relax. We have become human doings instead of human beings in a very real sense, and I think that's one of the most insidious forms of bondage that we have. Now next week we're going to talk about Moses and about, about the things that happened in that classic Bible story. But what I want to tell you today is that Moses, who was a type of Christ, Christ is a title, not a name, right? Moses is a type of Christ. What we know is that Jesus Christ holds the key to unlock the chains that hold us in bondage. It is Jesus Christ who calls us to deal with those around us with justice. So when we talk about the oppression of people as a form of bondage that we continue to practice today in our society, it is Jesus Christ who calls us to set the captives free.